Good morning, everybody. I don't, can I, does everybody, thank you. Good morning. My name is Clyde Wagner and I'm the president and CEO of TO Live. Uh, I'm going to give a brief introduction of who we are and, and what the building is that we're going to be focusing on today. And then we'll have some opportunity for questions from you to me uh, as we start. So thank you today for joining us. I know people are joining us from Echo. Someone's saying Echo. Is there a very bad Echo to everybody? No? Okay, I'm going to keep going. Uh, thank you. So TO Live is an organization that was formed about five years ago in response to a call from Mayor Rob Ford. When he was in office, saw declining usage and increase in costs in several of the buildings that we now operate. His response to that was to make a call for a sale of the buildings and the community stood up and said, no, they did not want them to be given up for condos, but to be kept as cultural spaces. A report was then drafted, which showed that there could be economic efficiencies if you brought these uh, three distinct and separating operating buildings together under one uh, mandate. Then uh, several years went by, uh, I was hired to bring the companies together and create a new company. And the question was purpose. What would the purpose be for these three cultural institutions under one roof? Ultimately, we decided what was the most important thing was to celebrate the diversity of the creative cultures in the city of Toronto and to uplift them in an organization which now, when combined, would be the same size as the ballet, the opera, and the symphony. This, combined with the newly formed foundation, creates a one-time opportunity for the city to really balance and celebrate all the cultures that are here in the city of Toronto, and that's the purpose of TO Live, and it's a really important one going forward, particularly after the COVID-19 pandemic, which I think we're in that space. We've just done a new five-year plan, which we started uh, during COVID. That plan starts in 2023 and it's called Making Space. That plan looks at creating creative community hubs out of, two, out of our two locations. One is Uptown at Young and Shepherd at the Meridian Arts Center, and one is Downtown, combining both Meridian Hall and the St. Lawrence Center for the Arts. Within these two spaces, uptown and downtown, there are seven theaters and an art gallery. Downtown, Meridian Hall is one of the largest or is the largest soft seater that's not an arena in Canada. It is sort of our Radio City of Canada and it does very similar programming to Radio City in New York City. Beside it, the St. Lawrence Center for the Arts, which is the building that we're focused on today, was built originally also as a centenary project in 1967 and 1970. It was launched as two theaters in it, the Blue Mapel Theater, which is an 800 seat theater, and a town hall like theater, which has approximately 400 seats. It's a brutalist building. It is an architectural uh, building of significance in the downtown core and has been labeled such as a heritage by heritage of the city of Toronto. But over time, it has been allowed to decay. And there is a very large state of good repair backlog on the building, which we inherited when we amalgamated and created the company TO Live over five years ago. When we looked at that through a building condition audit and we looked at the usage of the building itself, we, it presented to us a one-time opportunity as well to look at a redevelopment project that could create a space that would be more meaningful for the community overall and also deliver to the community a core purpose that we would need. And in so doing, once we did community consultations, which Leslie Lester, who's here with you today, uh, led over the last year and a half to two years, we found that one of the most important aspects of these buildings that is not being uh, leveraged today is public space. There is an ecosystem which can be created in contemporary performing arts centers, which balances out public space and creative space and presentation space to create a very successful ecosystem 
where people, public, artists, and creatives all come together in one space, creating a very exciting, thriving uh, institution in the core of a city. We've seen other examples of these in major urban centers, including London and New York, and we would like to create that kind of space here. In addition to that, we would like to link and create uh, one performing arts center space, linking both Meridian Hall and the St. Lawrence Center across what is currently Scott Street, uh, which is a very small street, uh, which is, uh, has traffic going both ways, north and south on it, but has already got an example of a, a street uh, laneway uh, extension north of Front Street, where they have taken away the sidewalks and made it level and made it so that you can close the street there. We're proposing a permanent closure and a connection and extension of Bursey Park south of Front Street between the laneway, which runs on the south side of the St. Lawrence Center and Front Street, which is on the north side of the St. Lawrence Center and creating a plaza between the two buildings. In our new strategic plan in the five years that we have going forward, one of the aspects that we're uh, focused on as an organization is sustainability. We would also, in addition to creating the Creative Community Hub downtown, creating additional public space, creating additional creative space in the building, we would like to make sure that this project leads the way in sustainability for creative spaces in Canada. And thus, we gets us here for the Better Buildings Bootcamp and to all of you. I look forward to uh, what we, what the outcomes are for this week. I'm looking forward to the creative discussions that are going to happen with this group. And I will be joining you on Thursday again. Uh, but now I'm turning it back over to you for questions. We have about 15 minutes for you to ask me any questions for our goals uh, for the organization. Hopefully you all have coffee. And if you're in Toronto, with all the rain, we might want to design an arc. This would be the interactive portion of the meeting. Hi, there's a question in the chat for you. Are there site plans available or visuals? Yes, there are site plans available. And there are visuals that you can see. They will be presented to you by Leslie. And uh, I believe our VP of operations is also here, Matt Carroll. Um, uh, Amkar, I think you have your hand up. You can unmute yourself and just ask. Um, Car, if you have a question, uh, I've unmuted you. Please ask. How many people here, while, while we're getting your mic to work, how many people here are actually in the city of Toronto or have seen the buildings themselves? Hello. Hi. Oh, finally. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, ask a question regarding uh, the process of uh, sanctioning the work. So at what stage we are currently with respect to the project? Like uh, we are just in the planning phase right now, right? And like you mentioned, you are suggesting certain uh, projections yes. uh, to like closing the Scott Street and other stuff. So where are we on uh, when it comes to the approval of these projects? So we are, we have approval by council to go forward with a design competition, which we're launching and in the beginning of September. 
Okay. And there are already studies done on street closures for the Str Scott Street street closure, and it's part of the proposal that we put before council. Does okay. that help? Uh, because uh, just just like you mentioned right now, uh, an interesting uh, thing which uh, uh, I noticed was, uh, uh, fortunately, I live uh, close to the site and I've seen it. So uh, there is a current construction going on around the front street. And uh, I just was curious to know if uh, we can uh, incorporate some of the things in just this moment as there is already a road closure going on. Um, <clears throat> yes, coordinating with the city, what the construction that you see going around the site, particularly on Scott Street, is a wastewater and sewage water construction that's happening currently. Uh, we won't be in construction for another three years or three to four years. So oh, okay. the coordination between the two won't happen, but but it would be nice to think that one hand of the city could coordinate with another hand of the city. So it's a good idea. Uh, yeah. Often it doesn't work that way, but yes, no, we're, we're, we're have a little bit of timing issue there, but good question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, ben, ben, please unmute yourself. And Jayshu, while we're waiting for Ben to un unmute himself, I see that you asked which three buildings functional spaces will need to be combined. We're really looking at the St. Lawrence Center for the Arts and the way it, uh, from a, a public planning point of view, can be connected to Meridian Hall, which is the two downtown spaces. They're at Front and Young, and they, are, they bridge over a small street, which is Scott Street. And the other street uh, to the south of Meridian Hall is the Esplanade and south of uh, St. Lawrence Center is a laneway, uh, which is the southern point of that, that uh, the space where the St. Lawrence Center sits on. John, you've asked, do you see the possibility for sustainability to be woven into the programming of the new center? Uh, connect, a connection between the physical building project and what goes on inside. Absolutely, we see a connection there. We see many connections between programming, what the physical building is and the programming which happens with uh, inside of it. Those connections are being explored even today. We have an ongoing company-wide consultation uh, where our relationship with the indigenous people of the land in the city of Toronto is going on right now. Our goals and objectives set with them and there's a strong connection between sustainability and indigeneity. Uh, not that they're they're completely linked, but this is a, a path that we would like to go down as well. And we're exploring all of those uh, systems that could be put into place once the building has been redeveloped. Uh, Jay Leko, I'm glad that you biked by there this weekend. I'm, hopefully you're not biking this morning by it because it's just pouring down rain here today, but I'm glad to be able to get through. Um, John Robinson, do you see a connection between the role of the art sector in Canada and sustainability? I absolutely, and it's a growing one. There are a bunch of new organizations just now being formed about greening the arts in Canada. And I think that this is a, a really interesting experimental project that can lead the way in a very physical manner uh, to show how sustainability can be performed in the, in the live uh, event sector in Canada. So I think it's a really interesting space to be in right now. Um, what would you phrase the problem statement to be in brief and explicit terms? The problem statement, I, uh, I don't really think of problem statements. I'm sorry to put it that way. I always think about opportunity. I think that there's a great opportunity now to create a space that is a public space for the people of the neighborhood, the city, and a creative space for the people of the country that does exactly what we were just talking about, which incorporates sustainability into the programming itself, which I think is very important. Robin, to what extent can, you, can your objectives be met by extensive retrofit versus full demo? Oh, Robin, that's an excellent question, which we've been exploring over the past two years. Uh, we're going to have to look at uh, reno retrofit uh, renovation. Um, it's, uh, it's a heritage building. So heritage aspects of the building must be maintained. So what how, what the line is there and how we can fit the community objectives in is very important. Currently, we have an outline 
that we are exploring that allows us both to meet the heritage objectives and and do what we need to do inside. That's the, I would say for architects, that would be the most fun. How do you do both of those things? How do you nod to the history of the brutalist architecture that is there, but also be able to hearken to the future and really look into trying to create a building that that meets all of our sustainable needs and the creative needs for the community. I think that's the big that's the big challenge. Back to uh, the question before as well, the big opportunity is the discussion to close Scott Street or Scott Lane. Sorry if I was already mentioned. I'm looking at the map now. Uh, Scott Street. It, if you look, if you're looking at the map, you'll see the street that that goes directly in between Meridian Hall and the St. Lawrence Center for the Arts. It runs north-south from Front to Esplanade, and the closure would be between Front Street and the laneway, which runs behind, which runs east-west behind the St. Lawrence Center for the Arts. We need to keep the laneway open for multiple reasons. It needs to remain open for loading dock purposes for the building for the St. Lawrence Center and also to be able to access the parking garage, which is in the condo tower, which is just south of the laneway on Scott Street. I hope that helps, Brian. Good question. Thank you. Uh, would Harry Potter like to perform at the reimagined new St. Lawrence Center? Uh, well, Harry Potter the real Harry Potter or Harry Potter the show? Um, Harry Potter the show wouldn't fit. Harry Potter, the real Harry Potter, I like a little magic, uh, so why not? Uh, what are the heritage aspects that have to be retained? Robin, that's an excellent question. I hopefully, I, I'm, excuse me, I'm sure Leslie and Matt will take you through what those aspects are. It's in the document that was presented through to council and the heritage was clear. It has to do with the facade uh, along uh, Scott and along front, and it has to do with aspects of the way the design needs to be retained uh, going forward and on the interior. Great question. We'll walk through that in detail with you before you start. John, we can green the arts sector, but can the relationship work the other way as well? Do the arts maybe have a crucial role in exploring the meaning and understanding of sustainability and relationship between humanity and nature? I, I think it's a great question. I think lots of people are exploring it and, and it's not just started now. I think people have been exploring this relationship between the arts and nature for a long time. I just think it's becoming more and more and more important. You know, the entertainment sector at large is, has been for a very long time, not a very green or sustainable sector. So I think the push now to try to create a system uh, which can become much more sustainable is really important. You know, a lot of what we do in entertainment, whether we like to believe it or not, is, is disposable. So when we build things, we build things for short periods of time. They're built out of materials that are not always recycled or, uh, and um, you see them turn over very quickly. You see this a lot in the film industry. You see it all in the theater industry and in presentation. We do a lot of travel because it's live. So people are touring all over the world. There's a lot of aspects to our business which are just simply not uh, green. And what we're looking at now is how do we both continue with the business because you don't want to completely kill off the sector, but still make sure that we can make it into a sustainable uh, industry itself. And I think the physical manifestation of this building and aspects of the way it works, it's a really good question, how do these two things go together and how are they going to work together over a period of time? I don't have, a, and hopefully you're not looking to me to give you all the answers because I don't have it. There's a lot of people working on it right now. Any questions? Anybody want to unmute un their mic and ask me a question? I'm happy to talk. With people too. Ruba, very good question. Yes, we have brought the community into workshop. Uh, we've been doing workshops and community consultation almost for two years now. There's a really great document that was published to city council 
we were working with an outside consultant and uh, we did it in multiple phases. We did a broad outreach uh, community survey. <coughs> Excuse me. Then we moved into a consultation phase. We did a pre consultation with the community. Then we narrowed down to a, a community group of representatives. They worked with a, a consultant and Leslie. They did a whole workshop over a series of months. And that was distilled down into the, the core building projects that thank you, Leslie, for putting it into the chat. You'll see that you'll see that that's how we got into the core uh, community uh, call for actions for what they would like from the building itself. Teal Live is is uh, it's a very good question. Teal Live is a, a both a creative property management company and a presenter of the arts in Toronto. But its core purpose is to uplift the diverse creative voices of the city of Toronto. So what that means is up until Teal Live was created, there were the only uh, cultural industries of scale were the ballet, the opera, and the symphony in the city of Toronto. So we looked at the landscape and said, if we really are the most diverse city in the, in the world, which is what Torontonians love to say, how can that be? How can we really call ourselves the most diverse city in the world and not, and not celebrate all of this diversity at the same scale or, or funding level? And so we created TO Live to do that and to balance that out. So we work within these buildings, but we also work external to the, 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 the physical buildings that we have itself. Does that help, Miles? Good question. Uh, Rusev, I'm gonna let BBC answer the question about lead well or fit well. I know just enough about each of those designations to be dangerous, but I, 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 I'm gonna let better people than I answer what the project's gonna be. Ankar, you have your hand up. Hey, thank you. I had just uh, one very big question. I think most of us might have it is, uh, do we have any budget for the thing or which would constrain whatever uh, ideas or solution we are going to plan for the scene? Yeah, budget. Gosh, why just right to the <laughs> question there. Um, so uh, yes, there is a budget. There's a budget that was announced for the test fit that we put forward. Uh, I think that's a good budget to use. Uh, the project was, uh, Leslie can give the details of it, but uh, with escalation costs and with timing costs, it was capped out at uh, just around $400 million. Okay. But I think one should look at the detail of that, uh, of the costing to see where we got to. Does that help? Hopefully that. Helps. Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I just wanted to know that uh, is there any budget constraint when we will be, you know, figuring out or brainstorming things uh, to whatever approaches we are going to take for the building? Well, there's always budget constraint. Uh, I think that I think that the number 400 is is the top number and we would certainly like it to be lower than that. Uh, it's a public building. That money is going to become from fundraising of various levels of government and also from private public fundraising. Uh, so we need to be able to, to meet that obligation. It's, it, that's it. I think it's got to be somewhere in that number. But good question. Always good to know what your target is. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Clyde. It was it was great to, to see you this morning. Um, this session is ending, and you can head over to the next one. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you again on Thursday.